right now we know there are three ways to specify a continuous time Markov chain. Let's look at all three. Uh, so one by one, the first way is the least interpretable way. Um, so here for every single X uh, and Y, every two states X and Y, and every single time T, you're given these transition probabilities. So these are very useful quantities. It's important to know um, what the probability, uh, probability is from going from X to Y and time T. But at the same time, these are gonna be complicated uh, expressions. Uh, and so you're gonna get very little insight from these complicated formulas. Uh, as to how the chain is actually behaving. And for this, we have way two, the most interpretable way. Um, here, for every single state, you're gonna have a rate. So we know what this number means. It determines the, um, the waiting time distribution. The distribution is exponential with rate Rx in that particular state. And then the embedded chain, as we've seen, uh, tells us where to go with probability Bxy when we switch states. We go from probability uh, from x to state y with probability b x y. Um, here is a couple of more notes. So we've seen that uh, for the embedded chain, which I've called z before, um, the self transition probability. Uh, there's really only one case. Either there are no self transitions, or the self transition probability is one whenever the rate is zero. So rate zero. Uh, means that we stay in state X forever, so we never leave. Therefore, the embedded chain just with probability one transitions back into state X. And here there's one more comment that we're talking about homogeneous CTMCs. So uh, quite obviously that homogeneity property uh, translates over to the embedded chain. In other words, the uh, probability of changing from state x to state y is the same at, at time zero as it is at any time k. All right, that's way two. Way three is the most parsimonious way, and this goes through the generator, sometimes called the transition rate matrix. For every pairs of states x and y, you have these numbers here. These are interpreted as transition rates in an instantaneous amount of time. We'll discuss this later. Um, but for now, keep in mind this conservation identity. If you think of R as a matrix, here uh, in that equation, we're summing up over the, uh, the um, uh, should be the, in an individual row, so over the columns, but you're basically summing across. You're going over row X, um, and you're going to get zero. And one way to remember this identity, here's a better way, um, this is saying that um, the rate out of state X, and this is gonna be the diagonal entry of the matrix R, uh, is the same as the total sum over all the rates out. So, you know, the, it's very sensible. If you want the rate of, um, of transitioning out of state X, all you need to do is sum up over all the possible rates uh, to which you can go to, uh, and that's the right-hand side. So um, finally, we have a way of connecting this um, generator way. So way three, we can connect it to way two uh, using this uh, identity here. This is saying that if you wanna get the transition rate from X to state Y, that's the total rate out of state X, discounted by this transition probability over to, uh, to state Y. Um, so this is a sensible formula um, and it connects us to the second way of specifying a CTMC. <clears throat> and then of course we can cycle all the way back to way one of specifying a CTMC. We have this Kolmogorov equation that we've seen before. And now if you have the transition rates, it's just a matter of in plugging them in into this uh, system of equations here. And now you have something that you can in principle solve on a computer. Uh, so this would be a, kind of a linear system of uh, ordinary differential equations. You have a derivative specified on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you have the things you're solving for times the coefficients, which are given to you by the rates. Um, and the solution of this will basically spit out the um, probabilities of moving between any two states, X and Y, in T units of time. So those are the three ways. All of them are mathematically equivalent, and you can go back and forth between uh, any of these. And so uh, one thing I want to mention now is uh, compatible with the 
uh, this transition rate matrix or generator way of looking at things is what's called the transition rate diagram, which is a useful way to, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, look at a problem and, and uh, understand what it, you know, what it actually um, is before starting to work through any kind of equations. So I'm going to describe what this transition rate diagram is, and I'm going to give you a few examples uh, to work from. So <laughs> in discrete time, there was a natural notion of one step. In continuous time, uh, we're going to refer to something that's instantaneous. So in other words, before we had uh, transition probabilities in one step, now we have instantaneous transition rates. So this is an instantaneous rate of transitioning from state X to state Y. And on a transition diagram, uh, just as in discrete time when we drew probability, uh, uh, transition probability diagrams, we're gonna only indicate um, those transitions that are non-zero. So whenever Rxy is non-zero, we're gonna draw uh, an error. We'll see what this looks like uh, in a minute here. Um, and that's what a transition rate diagram is. It's gonna have a circle for every single state and it's gonna have arrows um, between any two states x, y, uh, whenever this quantity is non-zero. So we're gonna draw arrows and connect all the different states with these instantaneous transitions. Now, one final comment and kind of a little bit of a difference to transition probability diagrams is that there are no self-transitions in this context. <clears throat> the reason is that this entry rxx can always be obtained from the sum of the rest. So if you remember this conservation of property that if you sum up the row of the transition matrix, that's equal to zero. Uh, well, because it, equal, because it equals to zero, the, the diagonal entry rxx has to be negative of the total rate out. Uh, and so for this reason, we never need to actually draw a self-transition because we can determine what it is uh, from this identity here. Uh, here is the Poisson process of rate uh, mu. This is the transition rate diagram for it. Not surprisingly, we can go from any state, let's say y, uh, 1, uh, to increment um, by 1. So every single state is just going to increment by 1 at a rate uh, equal to the rate of the Poisson process. So, um, you know, just from this diagram alone, uh, you can kind of get all the information you need. You can get the state space, you can get the one state transition probabilities of the embedded chain, you can get the transition probabilities between any two states in any amount of time, and so on and so forth. So let's look at the example of the Poisson process and how we construct that here. Um, immediately from this diagram, you see that the states are all natural numbers. That's uh, fairly obvious. This is uh, arrow here, right here at the end, essentially means continue on like this forever. And so, you immediately infer that the state space uh, is just the natural numbers. Now we have this conservation of rate here, um, which is saying that the rate out of state X better be the sum of all the rates in the transition diagram. For every single state here, there's only one arrow leaving with the rate of mu. Therefore, the rate of every single state is just mu. So we wait in every state for an exponential amount of time of rate mu. Um, and, you know, the last thing that, uh, uh, that I already mentioned before, the middle entry, the diagonal entry of the transition rate matrix, or the entry Rxx, is just negative the rate for that state. So this is a convention to ensure that the sum of the rows sums to zero. Um, finally, from, you know, I'll just quickly describe what happened so far. We had a transition rate diagram, and what we've been able to do is recover our generator, equivalently the transition rate matrix. <clears throat> and now uh, we're going to look at specifying um, the embedded chain probabilities. This is easy uh, because of this formula here. Uh, every single Rx here is non-zero. It's equal to mu. So you can very quickly get what the embedded chain probabilities are. Not surprisingly, what they're going to do is just for every single state x, you're going to have a probability of 1 of switching to state x plus 1, which is, you know, is suggested already by this diagram here. The only transition possible from 2 is to 3, and the embedded chain is going to say that no matter what, uh, whenever your time waiting time in that particular state uh, is through, uh, you move up by one. A and then, you know, eventually you can come back to this 
distribution of the Poisson process or the transition probability for the Poisson process, which we've seen, and you can get this from the Kolmogorov equations. Uh, here they are again. And you can see that in this example, the sum here on the right-hand side is gonna simplify quite a bit. You're gonna have two non-zero terms for R, Z, Y. So X is fixed and Y is fixed. That's right here. And now you just need to list, you need to ask yourself for what Z uh, do we get a non-zero rate? And there are gonna be precisely two of them for Z equal to Y and for Z equals to Y minus one. Those are the only two cases <clears throat> uh, as indicated by this transition rate diagram that you'll have a non-zero RZY. Uh, so the sum just dissolves into two terms. You can write down that ordinary differential equation and then you can actually go ahead and check that this, um, uh, uh, you know, this transition probability satisfies this uh, ordinary differential equation system which it does, and it's a good exercise to, to check this. Let's look at another example. This is a three-state example with states 0, 1, and 2. So here's the transition rate diagram. Immediately it tells you what the states are, and the arrows indicates the entries of our generator. Um, so uh, we can immediately go from this description to the generator, and then uh, we can talk about what the transition rates and the embedded chain probabilities are. So here I wrote down uh, the transition rates out for each state. Why is R0 equal to 0? Well, that's because you see no arrows leaving state 0. This is what would be called an absorbing state. Once the chain enters 0, it stays there forever. Uh, and because there are there's nothing uh, leaving, there are no arrows emanating here, uh, sum over nothing is, is zero. That's how you get this um, identity here. For the other two states, uh, of course, you do see arrows in the transition rate diagram. So in R1, you would sum up this the value of this arrow and the value of this one. The sum of those is equal to the rate out of state one. Um, and so on, you know, with state two. With state two, you would sum up over R to one, transition from two to one, and transition from two to zero. And then the rest is all a plug in. This is embedded chain one step transition probabilities. Um, this is just using the formula, or, you know, your, um, you know, hopefully you remember it. Let me just backtrack a little bit to, to show you the, the formula again. Uh, here it is. And you can work it, you know, left way or right way. Uh, if Rx is not zero, you just divide over and you have the expressions for the embedded probabilities here. So coming back to, um, to this, you can kind of go down the list and verify each one. Let's, you know, do one for practice here. Let's do, uh, well, why is B00 equal to one? Well, that can only happen when the rate of that state is zero. And indeed, uh, the rate of state zero is zero, we stay there forever, therefore the embedded chain is always just gonna self-transition to itself with probability one. Uh, the transition probability from B from state one to state two, well, that's just the rate of going from one to two divided by the rate of that state. And from above, you just plug it in. It's R12 divided by R1, which you can find right here, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So you can just go down the list and see that um, this, uh, you know, all of these expressions here are just direct um, implications of the, uh, the connection between the generator and the embedded uh, the transition probabilities. And one last thing, you can always kind of check your calculation by um, uh, noting that, for example, the transition probability um, from 2 to 0 better be 1 minus that from uh, 2 to 1. Why is that? Well, let's look at state two for a second. State two only has two possible um, transitions. And it, it, one of them goes to, to state one, the other one goes to state zero. So the embedded chain has only two places to go. And so once we've identified the probability of switching from state two to, to state zero, uh, you know that that has better be one minus the um, transition from uh, two to one. 
Uh, and so that's a good way of kind of once you get one of the calculations in, in this example, you get the other for free. Uh, here's a summary of all this. Uh, I'll later talk about how all of these um, expressions here uh, can be recovered from properties of exponential random variables. And this is going to bring us to the interpretation of the generator as uh, really a rate uh, in a certain um, you know, rate of an event that's happening. So we'll come back to that um, later on. Uh, and in the meantime, we're gonna, uh, we can look at uh, how this transition rate diagram uh, connects to the transition probabilities uh, between any two states. And this is gonna be related to the Kolmogorov equations. Um, in here, for these two particular pairs of states, they're pretty simple. So zero to state one, and zero to state two. So in other words, in time t, um, we're being asked for the probability of going from zero to either state one or state two. Well, there is no way to get to those states. Uh, there is no arrow emanating from state zero. Therefore, the rate there is zero. Therefore, the waiting time in that state is infinite. Therefore, the probability of getting from state zero to state one or from state zero to state two uh, in any finite time, uh, that's going to be zero. And here I wrote out all of the Kolmogorov equations, um, which is a little bit uh, painful, but let me walk through a couple of them. Um, but um, you know, once you write all of this out, you can see that it's you know pretty tedious even for this simple example. But you know, the point of writing this out is that you can plug it into a, a numeric solver uh, and uh, and solve the expression. And I'll have more explanations as to how to do that but for now let's look at one of these examples and see um, how this uh, differential equation could be written down so on the left hand side i'm looking at the derivative of the probability from one to zero in time t uh, the sum here is coming directly from the kolmogorov equation and what i'm now going to look at is which terms in the sum are non-zero um, so z i have a transition rate from z to zero and i'm being asked which ones are non-zero well r zero zero is zero r one zero is not zero which is why i've put it right there and r two to zero is not zero therefore i put it right here and so you go down the list and you fill out all of these equations you'll kind of see that the system decouples a little bit uh, if you look at these two variables uh, the mention of p10 and p20 uh, appears on the right hand side and so this is kind of a self-contained system two by two system of ordinary differential equations the same thing happens here with p12 and p11 uh, actually not quite um, I take it back uh, p12 oh no that's right p12 and p11 they all appear on the right hand side of these two so these two may be solved together separately and then these two P21 and P22 may be solved together separately because they're the ones that appear on this right hand side. So you have three two by two systems that you can solve. There are classes on, on solving ordinary differential equations like this. These are called linear uh, ordinary differential equations. Uh, but I'll show you later how you can just um, use Python or R uh, to solve these things efficiently for any example, not just this one. Uh, and as you can see with just three states, it can get pretty complicated. Um, here is the more general sort of framework of, of working um, through these problems when you have any number of finite states. So your state space is finite. In that case, your generator can be written down in matrix form and so can the Kolmogorov equations. So this is a way to write down the Kolmogorov equation in uh, matrix form. So I'm using matrices. Let's look at you know, each one. This R here is going to be the n by n transition rate matrix. So in other words, the ij to entry, uh, oops, that's the ith entry. Uh, the ij to entry is just the transition rate, the instantaneous transition rate from i to j. Uh, P here is going to be the n by n matrix of transition probability. So every entry is the probability of moving from you know, that particular state, say state i to state j into units of time. Uh, and of course, um, uh, when you take a derivative of a matrix, it's the same as going entry by entry and taking a derivative of every single entry. And you can write down 
the Kolmogorov equation for every single entry. This is the same expression that we've seen before many times. And you can see that it actually maps to this matrix operation here. When you're multiplying two matrices, you're going to take the column of the first, the row of the first one, and take a dot product with the column of the matrix that you're multiplying things by. And that's exactly what's happening in these indices. See, look, I have the i row fixed, and I'm going uh, across k, so I'm going across the the ith row of the matrix P. And I'm going down, I'm going across the rows, fixing the jth column of the matrix R. So this is, uh, you know, directly, uh, this uh, sum here is directly um, uh, mirroring the, this matrix multiplication and what happens to get, what, what you do uh, to get the ijth entry. Um, there is uh, going to be a general way to write down or at least to represent a solution. Um, it's this one. So this is a general way to write down what the solution is. It looks very strange, as you notice. It says that a matrix is equal to e to the matrix itself. This is called a matrix exponential. And I'll have a clip uh, talking about um, how to compute this and how to think about uh, this expression. But uh, the main summary here is that if you have a finite state um, continuous time Markov chain and you know its generator or the transition rate matrix R, you have this matrix, uh, you can use all sorts of software packages to solve for uh, this, uh, you know, pairs of all probabilities in, in any um, amount of time. So like I said, I'll, I'll have more on this later. And for now, that's the end of this uh, clip.